Hello, everyone, and welcome to our union symposia, Managing Compounding Impacts from Extreme Events Through Sustainable. Sorry. Um, hold on. Is it better now? This is, is it good? Still not here? I'll scream. <laughs> is that good? <laughs> Sorry, this is the best I can do. I'll speak really loudly. Um, welcome to Managing Compounding Impacts from Extreme Events Through Societal Crisis. We have four fantastic speakers, uh, but before we speak, let me just give you a quick rundown of how this came about. Uh, when Victor, Emmanuel, and Misha uh, came up with the idea that this was going to be a union symposia, and Chloe offered me to moderate it, I was really excited because we had just come out, well, we were still living the impacts of the double earthquakes that had happened in Turkey and Syria. Um, and in fact, uh, I had uh, given a quote to one of the blog posts that was published by EGU uh, when Hazel Gibson asked me to comment on the earthquakes that happened in February 6. I said, we have been living in a state of polycrisis for several decades now, both man-made and nature-based. A double earthquake affecting several cities almost simultaneously may be a unique case study for the textbooks, but nevertheless, the fatal leg in response time and the humanitarian crisis that unfolded with every hour of delay is proof that we are still stuck at the initial steps of our learning curve. Now, um, you may have heard the quakes, obviously, but what was even more devastating was um, something that we actually forecasted was going to happen uh, an atmospheric river that was building up on the region, which uh, ended up in extreme rainfall immediately after the earthquakes, which ended up in uh, fatal landslides and massive debris flow. So uh, this also uh, really endangered a lot of the aid effort that was going into the area, and it showed how weak as we were uh, in terms of uh, providing aid to those that were affected. So. This session, in this session, hopefully with our four fantastic speakers, we're going to uh, talk about these uh, compounding events, perma crisis, meaning long lasting crisis that seem to be never ending like the COVID pandemic that we just went through, uh, as well as poly crisis, meaning multiple crises happening at the same time and how we as scientists or policymakers or the general public can uh, deal with their impacts. So um, with that, without further ado, as I say, I will pass the mic over to Philip Ward, who is the Professor of Global Water Risk Dynamics for, uh, at the Institute for Environmental Studies at VU Amsterdam. And um, we will start with Philip, and I will in introduce each speaker as we go along. Philip, the mic is yours. Okay, good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you to the uh, organizers of this session for giving me this opportunity to talk. Thank you all for coming. I hope we have a nice, uh, lively debate this morning. Um, I want to first start with um, a short reflection over the last decade that uh, we really have seen a move, I think, already to a, a increase in our understanding of natural hazard risks. And I think that a large, for a large part, this really is linked to these large global policy initiatives like the Sendai Framework, the Paris Agreement, the sustainability, uh, the SDGs, and so forth. And I, I do see that over the last few years, uh, also within the, the scientific realm, we've really seen this push to try to understand risk in a much more holistic way. Um, and I just want to uh, highlight a few um, yeah, special uh, things which I think have been quite instrumental in this. So first is uh, a number of networking events that have been taking taking place. Uh, one of those being the, the risk can, and uh, specifically the risk can groups on, on compound extremes, but also on uh, multi hazard uh, early warning systems, which have really brought together a lot of people, a lot of community building to start to think about these kinds of events that we're talking about today. Uh, another one that I, I would mention is the Democles cost action, which was led by Jakob Scheisler over the last years, 
And it's really deep in our understanding, especially of these compound climate extremes, especially from the physical science perspective, and now starting to move more uh, also to the linkages with risk and, and response. Um, and the third initiative, or, or a bunch of initiatives, I guess, which is worth mentioning, is uh, what the EGU itself has been doing at these uh, general assemblies. So I think it was uh, a very nice addition to the natural hazards um, division in 2019, when the uh, multi-hazards uh, subdivision was set up. And I, I, I really applaud the EGU for doing that, as well as uh, the people who, who put that together, Joel Gill and Marlene de Rauter for pulling that together. Uh, so I do see, actually, that there already is this move towards this more holistic understanding of risk and the community to do that. In fact, uh, I heard that there is a, a, a dinner planned on Thursday uh, on for people on this topic, which will uh, have over 150 participants. So that shows that we've made quite some advance, I think, in building a network at least. Um, but of course, there are quite a lot of challenges that we still uh, that we still have, and I'd just like to touch on a few of those. So one of them, I think, is really the diverse uh, language and terminologies on this multi-hazard compound risk that we have. Um, so uh, there's there's different phrases, right? Compound risk, multi-risk, multi-hazard, systemic risk, cascading risk, complex risk, poly uh, crises. Uh, and I think that often the, these terms are used quite interchangeably, uh, have different meanings to different communities. And in my exchanges with a lot of stakeholders, this also leads to uh, quite a lot of, of confusion. So I think it's important that we uh, continue to address these, these issues as a community. Secondly, uh, I think that there's been a lot of fantastic work going on to develop methods, tools, approaches within the scientific realm to try to address these kinds of whatever you call them, multi-hazards, multi-risk, compound risk, et cetera. Um, however, I, I think that we still kind of lack an overview. Right? We seem to have a forest of many different methods, but, but people are not so aware that they sometimes exist or which methods could be used for, for which uh, problems, et cetera. Um, I, I, in my discussions with stakeholders in our projects, I, I, I also hear a lot that there's, there's, there's simply a lack of clear frameworks and also guidelines for practitioners on how they should consider these multi-hazard risk, compound risk within their day-to-day um, -day work, within uh, designing policies, um, designing adaptation strategies, and, and so forth. Um, and, and then more from a, a fundamental science aspect, I think we, we really still lack, although this is advancing quite rapidly, uh, an understanding of the dynamic feedbacks between different as drivers of risk, so between the hazard, between the exposure, and between the vulnerability. And um, and I think this you, you touched on it in the introduction, right, with the, the earthquake which happened uh, in the in the spring of this year in Syria, Turkey, uh, followed by the the floods. Um, and I, I think that we really need to get a deeper understanding of how these uh, events really. Uh, have a, a, a deep impacts on also the exposure, the vulnerability, and how these these feedback loops uh, uh, contribute to the overall risk, and, and importantly, how we can reduce that risk. I think. Uh, and then the final challenge, which which I would like to note, of course, there's more, but the last one I will note is um, that we have a lot of great science going on, a lot of very nice papers, quite a lot of nice opinion and perspective papers on these topics. Uh, but I think that we also still lack in some real in-depth case studies where we try to actually build solutions uh, which, which, which look into these multi-risk, compound risk aspects. So that's something I think that we should address going forward. And in the remaining couple of minutes that I, that I have left, I just want to sketch a few activities which are taking place to, to address some of these challenges um, that, I, that I address. But uh, I would like to bring to your attention a couple of sessions for the rest of the week, where there will be a lot of science uh, very relevant to this, uh, to this. So tomorrow there will be the NH 10.1 session, looking at multi-hazards and multi-risks. And on Friday morning, ITS 1.4 session on compound risk, where really, um, yeah, the, the scientific advances in this field in the last years will be will be really uh, displayed. Some, so at the moment, I am coordinating a Horizon 2020 project called Myriad EU, and actually, what we are trying to do is to really uh, develop approaches together, co-develop approaches with stakeholders that allow us to make more flexible and adaptive 
uh, pathways to the future which account for different kinds of hazards, how they interact with each other, interactions across sectors, across regions, and so forth. And I just want to uh, talk very briefly about some of the outcomes of, of that project so far. First one is trying to address this, this um, the, all of these terminologies and, and lack of an overview of methods. So we developed a, a, a something called the Disaster Risk Gateway, which is actually a wiki portal uh, where we try to bring together different methods, tools, etc. And it's, it's a proper wiki portal, so the idea is that anybody can contribute to that. So I would also encourage this community here to contribute. And if anybody wants to know about it, you can talk to me afterwards uh, to really be a hub to, to share uh, knowledge together. Secondly, is we have developed a, a six-step framework with guidance protocols on how to actually uh, carry out a multi-hazard risk assessment. This has been led by our colleagues at IASA and is now also being tested together in five uh, regions throughout Europe to see uh, how, how it works, but whether we can use them to actually develop forward-looking disaster risk management plans over the next two to three years. Uh, uh, thirdly, a very nice uh, product which will also be presented this, this, this week by, is by uh, Judith Klassen, and that is a multi-hazard data set. So this is basically a data set which allows anybody to look at different combinations of hazards that have occurred in the past, overlaps in time, overlaps in space, and that will all be uh, publicly available very shortly. Uh, fourthly, uh, a contribution by Julius Schlumberger, and that is DAP MR. What is that? Uh, this is an approach to actually develop these forward looking pathways, right? So I think some of us know about these adaptation pathways where you uh, have a policy goal in the future and different ways, different lines that you could take uh, to get there with different change points in the future, depending on when you reach thresholds. And the idea is that we're really trying to tailor this approach more to this multi-hazard, multi-risk uh, domain. And that will also be tested within the project. Um, as I said, we're trying to actually apply these in real life cases to address that, uh, that, that knowledge gap that we identified. And then finally, I think it's important to, to note that uh, we're not doing this alone. Uh, so we've identified six, seven, eight, it keeps growing, uh, other large-scale projects which are, have similar goals to ours, like Paratus, HUT, Mediate, Miraca, and others. And we're trying to coordinate across those projects so that we can really synergize uh, and collaborate. And I think it's very nice that there will be a splinter meeting today amongst those projects to try to do uh, just that. So I think, um, I think that... We still have a way to go, but I really see that the science behind this is advancing very rapidly, um, and I'm very happy to see that in the last years. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Okay, our next speaker is Tina Combs. Tina is a professor in decision theory and ICT for resilience. She's from uh, Delft University of Technology, and the floor is yours, Tina. Thanks so much for introducing me. I hope you can see me all right and hear me all right, because it's still strange to speak in these hybrid setups. I can't see the room. I can only see the speakers, and I hope <laughs> that their reaction reflect kind of your reactions. Um, thanks also from my side for, to invite me for this panel and this uh, super interesting and very timely discussion. Now, um, I wanted to start, or like I'm, I'm, I wanted to start with an introduction of why I think I'm sitting here, at least partially. So um, together with colleagues um, coordinated under SAPEA, that's the Science Advice for Policymakers by European Academies. We were over the past one and a half, two years, um, gathering evidence and working on an evidence review report that looks at strategic crisis management in the European Union, but also in the science, on the science about it. And it's my pleasure to talk a little bit about that here. Because when we speak about compounding events, and of course, uh, Philip has beautifully explained um, why and, or that there is a lot of science and that we uh, do not do know a lot more. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, Birkham has also pointed quite drastically out that there are still a lot of issues to solve and, and many things to bridge. And I think also when that earthquake happened, one of the colleagues with whom we were working in that uh, in that review report said very drastically, well, that's the sort of textbook example 
of um, yeah of why disasters are they say not natural, right? There's always vulnerability, and in that case, drastic, severe vulnerability um, that is exploited by an event or then several and several compounding events. And so the message that I, I think is, is central here is that we really have to understand the interplay between vulnerabilities of our societies um, and uh, hazard events. Um, and that we have to think about yeah, the, the reaction on the interaction of societal systems, environmental systems, and also technology and technological systems like the built environment, if we want to understand that. Because indeed what was said before is, you know, our world is changing. Earthquakes have been there for ages, but there are other events of which we will likely see more and more uh, fueled both by climate change and increasing vulnerability, um, ever densely populated cities, um, people building in areas that will become very vulnerable, um, and threats to livability of some places. On top of that, that, we have also seen the outbreak of zoonotic diseases. We know that we are struggling with the loss of biodiversity and so forth. And that really means that we have to go away from looking at a hazard as a single individual event. And we have to understand crisis as these protected long-term and interdependent events. And that is what also Wilke mentioned already with the notion of polycrisis, which has that notion that one plus one can be more than two. Um, so crises that are amplifying and strengthening each other, right? It is not that if you, for instance, have an infectious disease, a pandemic in an area that is affected by a flood, an earthquake, a tsunami or a typhoon, uh, that this is that you can say I can decompose it. My healthcare system deals with the uh, with the uh, um, infected people, and my my um, civil protection services will deal with the earthquake. They are overlapping, and they are strengthening each other, amplifying each other. And we have to, you know, equip ourselves to deal with these crises. And there are, I think, many steps that have already been taken, but there's also more that we can do. I mean, we have to have. Arthur here who will speak more about ECHO, and I know that, for instance, the JRC has been also working on, on a lot of steps, but really understanding these crises as dynamic events um, that unfold as we go ahead is key to the problem. The second like pledge and plea that I would like to make here is also um, considering the strategic level and the long-term implications of crisis or our interventions to crisis. We very often see, of course, that in crisis, decisions are made very much driven by the urgency to help the people affected. Um, but at the same time, you know, in these very complex and interdependent systems, we see that the choices we make now, the interventions, the large scale investments have very long term consequences. And very often we may discard these future long-term consequences in the heat of the moment, because we are focusing so much on what is um, here and now. And there are many examples from that, from building back in coastal areas where we know that they will be very vulnerable to the, um, to the response in uh, to the Ukraine war and the gas crisis, where we saw that coal power plants were fired or have been fired up again across the EU. So that means we need to we need to have more layers to think about the implications of crisis. And I think also there, you know, a lot of research is needed. As I said, we were doing an evidence review for the EU on strategic crisis management. There is surprisingly little published on strategic crisis management and the strategic implications of crisis and crisis interventions. Maybe also because it would require more longitudinal work and not just like the six, six weeks three months, half a year after a disaster. I do also think that there is a lot of opportunities um, to now get, for instance, to this data and also make the links between the different disciplines that is so much needed. Because again, that's another challenge. If we want to understand these complex problems, we need to combine you know, uh, yeah, the, different, uh, the different knowledge areas, not only just the different um, disciplines working on the hazards from the flood people to the meteorologists and the, the earthquake and soil modelers. 
but we really also need to branch out to society. Yeah, if you, I will put the, also the link to the reports in the chat if you're interested. And other than that, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tina. And our next speaker is Elena Rovanskaya, and she is the program director and principal research scholar uh, for advancing systems analysis program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to this session. I'm delighted to be able to speak here in, on this very, very important topic. Um, the angle that I would like to take in, in my short intervention, I would like to talk about science systems. And we are all scientists here, or most of us. So I think that's an appropriate forum to actually discuss how science systems should respond and should transform itself in order to be serving the society much, much better uh, for addressing this poly crisis and, and perma crisis and all other crises combined. So what I will be talking about will be a very short summary of a project that uh, my institution, uh, IASA, Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, located here in Austria, undertook uh, at the very beginning of COVID-19 pandemic. So already we started in spring 2020 uh, and we finished it in early 2021. So, so this was a very rapid project that we started in order to see how can we learn from very early lessons of COVID-19 as the pandemic was unfolding. At that time, we did not know, of course, how it would be in two, three years from that time. But we thought that already very first experience uh, was very useful to actually see uh, how our systems are prepared or not prepared to react and respond to a crisis like that. And now we know that COVID-19 was a significant crisis, but perhaps not the most severe crisis we can think of, and has to be careful giving such kind of judgments, but, but I guess we would all agree that we can also imagine a much more severe crisis. So in that sense, for us as experts, it was good, in quotation mark, to have it for stress testing of our systems. And so what we did at YASA in, 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 in partnership with International Science Council, ISC, whose mission is to actually think of how science systems should develop in the future. So we undertook this rapid assessment of response that many national and international systems uh, gave the early response to COVID-19. And we derived five clusters of recommendations of what could be improved in the science systems and adjacent systems to science uh, in order to be better prepared to crises like this, which for sure will happen in future. So I would like to share with you these five um, headings and five clusters, and hopefully in the discussion we can have more time to discuss some of those points. So the first cluster of recommendations had to do with uh, strengthening transdisciplinary research and networking on critical risks and systems resilience. So that's, it sounds like an obvious thing, but, but why does it not happen? So what, what could be done concretely to facilitate that? So one idea that our project came up with was that um, one should consider adding what is sometimes called threats without enemies to the notion of security. So all these um, disasters that we talked about, natural and, and, uh, and anthropogenic disasters, you can call them threats without enemies. So, so it's, it's threats to all of us, and they do constitute a threat to our security, but not to the national or state security, but to what is called human security. And so the notion of human security could have been, could be promoted to the much higher level, much higher importance at the political level, both nationally and internationally. And if that could happen, then of course, it would naturally imply that there should be more research on that, there should be more funding going to these topics and so on and so on. So, so, so placing this human security high on the political agenda would be something that could, could help us in, in that. 
So the second uh, cluster of recommendations that we came up with uh, had to do with the capacity of science to respond rapidly to crises that unfold very quickly, like COVID-19. So not all crises are like that. So some of our crises are chronic crises, but some of them are unfolding very, very fast, like, like this was the case with COVID. So what we saw in the COVID, in this analysis of COVID response is that uh, basically our systems were not prepared for, for, for such rapid uh, development of the crisis. And so what, what could be done then? There were a number of concrete ideas that, that went under this heading, for example, that we could have prepared protocols before the beginning of, of the crisis on how so-called emergency teams of researchers could be very quickly put together to address a specific crisis that requires multidimensional and multidisciplinary input, as Tina was just uh, telling us about. So, Basically, when the, start, when the crisis starts, it's too late to think about this protocol. So they should be ready much before and they should be prepared during so-called normal times. And then once, the, once we enter the crisis, then simply those protocols should be activated. So there are many other, many other points here, again, uh, which we maybe can address in the discussion. One, I would also mention, uh, we as scientists know that, that we always face the dilemma of making our research very context specific or less context specific, more broad and more universal. There is always this, this dilemma that, that we are all facing when we design our own research projects. So what we also know is that Usually, the, the, the fact that our research can be reusable and reused in the future is not a criterion for any evaluation of this research, whether this is at the level of uh, allocating funding for it or whether it's at the level of accepting a paper for a publication and so on. So, however, what COVID showed is that exactly the models that were developed before to address, for example, um, outbreaks of SARS or MERS viruses were actually useful in the beginning of COVID in the absence of empirical data and information on COVID itself. So, so in fact, it turned out that those teams and those researchers who developed those models, they, yeah, they, their work basically helped a lot to, to, to at least form the first response to COVID. Of course, once more data became available, it was less needed, but, but in the beginning, it was very important. So, so paying more attention to reusable research, reusable models, uh, that, that is also another point here. So the third, the third um, cluster of our work had to do with knowledge diffusion within the science system itself. So, so we know that the science system itself is very silent. Not only there are boundaries of disciplines, there are also national cultural boundaries. And again, for a crisis like COVID, for example, what we need, we need very fast, very rapid diffusion of knowledge from across all these boundaries. Yeah, and again, uh, many uh, things could be done here. Uh, they have to do with how we publish our research. They have to do how we publish data, how we make data open, how we make da data interoperable, and all those things. I think you're all also very well aware of that. So the fourth uh, heading here is uh, about communication of scientific knowledge and public understanding of that and therefore trust in science. So, so that's in itself a big topic. It not only has to do with crisis, it's a bigger topic, but of course, in times of crisis, trust in science becomes really, really critical. And there are a number of things that one could do to improve trust in science. That's a big topic in itself. One aspect here is scientific literacy of citizens themselves. So very often we hear it's scientists who have to communicate better. It's scientists who have to do science translation. Yes, but there is also a receiving side to that. And the scientific literacy of citizens is something that, that uh, in the view of this uh, project should actually be really a priority in the future. And finally, the fifth uh, point here, the fifth uh, cluster of issues uh, have to do with science policy interface. So it's not the science system as such, but the, the interface with policy. Again, Tina mentioned a few important points already in that regard. Obviously, it has to be improved. Uh, many aspects here to consider. One is diversity of scientific input that goes into the ears of policymakers. Uh, their, again, ability to absorb that input and, and everything that has to do with that. 
yeah so 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 there are many other many other specific recommendations that we developed i should have said in the beginning so this was a co-creation co-development project where we had uh 43 international experts representing really very different science systems and parts of science systems from funders to leaders of scientific institutions to reviewers to to uh, editors of journals and so on so so we really combined expertise of of basically major players in the science systems and we brought them together to produce this uh, around 40 recommendations that, that that we produced and provide this uh, comprehensive assessment so this was coming from that group of um, international experts that we assembled very quickly yeah thank you thank you very much and i look forward to discussion Thank you, Elena. And our final speaker is Arthur Malantovic. He is the team leader of the Knowledge Network Coordination Team for the Directorate General for European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations. And after Arthur, we're going to open the floor for questions and discussion. So start preparing your questions now. Good morning, Gina. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I think it's it's a very interesting perspective uh, for me to be in uh, as a former uh, researcher or researcher in former professional life. Now being uh, more on the policy making front, uh, I do look forward to the uh, exchanges that we also have in the more dynamic part of this uh, of this session. I was thinking for quite a moment, what can I contribute with? Uh, when talking about managing compounding impacts, uh, especially when I'm at the last of the speakers. So I thought I would zoom in uh, on the core business of the work that we do in DG ECO in this particular aspect, that is the union civil protection mechanism. And to set the scene, uh, let me bring some not so fun facts and figures uh, from the latest European State of Climate 2022 report that was just published uh, uh, a moment ago. 2022, um, Europe has been warming faster than any other continent continent twice the global average rate for a large part of europe 2022 was the warmest year on record the summer temperature for europe was the highest on record the the, the higher temperature lack of precipitation and so on have triggered a very significant significant drought on the two-thirds of the eu territory all of that combined have led to the intensification and facilitated the spread of wildfires. That was the second uh, worst fire season in the EU, 2022. When you add to that the still ongoing pandemic, when you add to that the Russians war uh, of aggression against Ukraine and the impact of that situation to, to our uh, reality in Europe, you have a very complex uh, reality that uh, I think is also the the, the, the backbone or the, the background uh, against what has been happening at the EU level in the area of civil protection. Um, we have noted 106 activations of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Five times more than the average before COVID five times more, which means that five times more than uh, average uh, before COVID, the uh, international community, the mostly member and participating states, but also other stakeholders, were uh, faced with the situation that were unable to deal with the consequences of different crises, disasters happening at their uh, in their countries. Because this is exactly the role of the EU in the context of uh, disaster management of, or crisis response. We have a supporting competence so primary responsibility lies with the national civil protection authorities and only where their resources and their capacities are um, exhausted, they request uh, assistance at the EU level. This is where the union civil protection mechanism kicks in, a um, mechanism that was established already over 20 years ago in 2001, and that has been gradually expanding with the uh, different activities offered by the mechanism. Uh, but also with the growing depth of uh, assistance and the components that we have at our disposal uh, at the EU level. Um, for those who are less familiar, 2013 brought a big revision of the legislation that introduced, first of all, the European Civil Protection Pool, 
which is a, a set of uh, modules, teams, and capacities that the member states and participating states of the mechanism uh, declare to be used, to be available when the crisis hits and when the other countries cannot deal with the situation. 2013 has also brought establishment of the European uh, Emergency Co Coordination Center, ERCC, Emergency Response Coordination Center, which is an entity that is coordinating the uh, requests that are being issued uh, to the EU and then coordinates the response at the EU level. And further, uh, revision of 2019, again, when faced with growing intensity of disasters with uh, as a kind of lessons learned uh, from the third tragic situation of uh, wildfires in Portugal in 2017, the new addition to the uh, to the mechanism is being brought forward. That is the Rescue EU, which is for the first time an independent capacity of the EU to actually respond to different disasters. It covers many different types of capacities, area of forest fire fighting, uh, medical capacities, medical evacuation capacities, as of recently also shelter, and transport capacities and so on and so forth. So a growing array of tools that are put at the disposal at the Europe, of the European community to be able to better uh, address the exactly more compounding uh, impacts, uh, effects of, of different extreme events that are um, affecting our societies, our countries. And fast forward 2023, so against this old background, um, we've been also trying to, at the EU level, uh, exactly embrace uh, the, the change in the mentality or change in the approach to uh, addressing the crisis that we are dealing with. And as Tina already has mentioned, you know, uh, two years ago, we have requested as the EU uh, a, a scientific input into our vision, how the strategic crisis management at the EU level should look like. We're trying to uh, convince our colleagues, our counterpart in the member states, that it's a moment to, you know, kind of escape the response-driven uh, approach and start looking uh, forward. You know, increase our foresight capacity, in increase our anticipation, and be better prepared uh, for all those different eventualities that are uh, lying ahead of us. Uh, because, as, as I mentioned, you know, every single amendment or change in the uh, legislation related to the Union Civil Protection Mechanism uh, so far has been related to our experience of the response. If something happens, we are not fully able to address it. Only then we learn and then we improve, which is, of course, a natural way of, uh, way of doing things, if, uh, as, as it is the case of the, of the mechanism, is that we have a supporting competence. We are only meant to step in when the, uh, when the member states cannot deal with the crisis. And when the crisis keep increasing, the member states uh, realize more and more that the, there is a need for um, a better response at the EU level. Um, and against this background, again, um, we have a new concept of disaster resilience goals uh, that we, together with the member states, uh, we've been discussing over the last uh, two years, that we are now proposing to the member states to improve their national systems to support their disaster resilience uh, in the area of civil protection. And perhaps, you know, you've heard about them, maybe they are not revolutionary in the content. Uh, they do somehow uh, resemble uh, some part of this um, Sendai framework because they call for stronger anticipation. They call for better prepared, prepared, better prepared societies, better risk aware, uh, aware societies. They call for more robust um, civil protection systems in the, in the member participating states. So in a way, the obvious dimension, the obvious elements yet not fully present on the ground. And this is the, 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 the our latest push, push to, uh, to have that dimension strengthened because without that change, in, in building in uh, a resilience into our policy making, it's, it's going to be very difficult for us to manage the future crisis. Um, and we're hoping that by the activities that we uh, try to uh, organize in partnership with the member and participating states of the mechanism, in partnership with different uh, stakeholders that are active in the sector. And that includes academia, that includes the, the research, uh, that includes the uh, civil society stakeholders, that includes private sector. Because the, there is so much knowledge, so much experience, both uh, tacit and, and scientific, that is uh, available, uh, but not fully capitalized on. 
Um, I really like the the points that Elena made uh, at the end in her recommendations. The the the, the gap in in communication between the the science world and the society, but also between the science and the and the and the policy world. There's clearly a gap or miscommunication that is happening, and that's something that we could potentially strengthen our um, approach. Um, so I'll, I'll finish by saying that you know one of the uh, initiative that were introduced as well as well in the 2019 revision of the legislation of the mechanism was the Union Civil Protection Knowledge Network, which has its as, as its vision that the Union Civil Protection Mechanism and its community will have the knowledge and expertise to uh, effectively do their work. So to prevent, prepare, uh, prepare for and respond to different crises and challenges that we're facing in disaster risk management. So we're hoping that uh, by bringing together those different stakeholders that have that knowledge, we'll be able to at least partially um, contribute to uh, a better future in that context. So that the numbers that, uh, or the facts that I, I referred to at the beginning, uh, maybe will not be uh, as uh, scary uh, as they seem to be in the, in, in the first reaction. So I'll finish here, uh, and I look forward to the questions and discussions that follow. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, and with you, uh, thanks to all the speakers. Um, now, we designed the session so that uh, the question and answer part of it could also act as a brainstorming session. So feel free to um, ask your questions to our speakers, um, and I can take the first question now. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, please. Here? Yes, you can hear me. Hi, Irene Manzella from um, the Center for Disaster Resilience at uh, University of Twente. I have a question that is related to what you were saying, Arthur, um, because we have a problem in the sense that we are scientists and we developed and we are developing a lot of tools and software and uh, methodology, citizen science approach, community-based approach to uh, face uh, compound risk and to increase the resilience. But then we have a, a problem in translating this into uh, implemented action and how we can really uh, use those tools and software and, and things we developed in uh, for the civil protection. So how we can manage to bridge this gap and get the civil protection to use those tools. And this is because there is a period of validation and, and testing of those tools, and we might not have the time to do all this validation and testing. Now, we, how can we accelerate this pro process and how we can bridge this gap, not only with communication, but also to accelerate this validation process and testing? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to collect several questions and then we... Uh, response or should I go ahead? No, I, th I think we can go ahead and command. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question. And it's 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 a very pertinent one and the question that keeps coming back. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, my response would be involve the civil protection authorities uh, as early as it's possible. I mean, involve them in the research that you're doing as your end users uh, or as a, a, a advisory entity. Because ultimately, they are the ones, I mean, and by, by civil protection authority, I mean the national authorities, regional authorities, local authorities, they are different organizational system in different countries. Because they are the, the ones that will be using different technologies uh, in practice. What we do uh, at the EU level is only a small supplement to the activities that are happening uh, nationally or regionally. So we effectively have very little say um, to put it very bluntly, as to what technology uh, is being used uh, in different operations, because we capitalize on the work, on the knowledge of the of the people, of the staff that is being provided by the by the national civil protection agencies. Um, so again, the answer would be involve them as much as possible at the earliest state uh, stage possible as well, um, and involve them proactively. Um, because if you secure their participation, you secure their buy-in uh, at that stage, they will effectively turn into those that will be, you know, utilizing your um, your technologies, your your methodologies, your your tools, 
um, and then that would be also allow you to improve them once once the, you also get feedback from the uh, from the, the the first trials. Thank you. Um, before we move on to another question, would any one of you like to pick up or Tina on this question and add anything? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tina. Sorry. I need to put my first. microphone down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank, thanks also for, from my part for the question. I think there's multiple answers to that. One is we really have to also find out if we develop technology, um, what, what type of gap we are really closing in practice. What I mean by that is, for instance, we know that Turkey is an earthquake prone country. That's why Turkey has, you know, very strict building codes, of course. So we also then, you know, we know uh, a lot of things. And sometimes it is about not just developing new technology, but how can we leverage that knowledge to really make the change happen? And there, you know, I think most speakers commented on uh, science policy interface in you know, different layers. And it, it also doesn't always need to be policy. It could also be science practice interface as in uh, yeah, working with civil protection authorities or other authorities. But I think there is a big gap in just making the case for change and helping people sort of give, give them uh, whatever evidence they need so that they can make that push, which you know can be potentially very costly, very inconvenient. Um, rebuilding everything is, is definitely not easy. So one is how can we make that? Um, and then, in terms of the um, of the uh, of the of the testing and and validating, uh, of course, you know disasters have conventionally been considered as um, very hard to validate on because you know they are extreme events. Um, right now, and that's I think also something that uh, has been invested in a lot by the European Commission. We have a lot of data about disasters. I think we can still get a lot better in bundling that data and uh, making the data from different disciplines and angles accessible to many people. But in principle, I do think, you know, for, for more like validation on different case studies, there are now unprecedented opportunities because we know so much more and because we have, uh, we have access to much more. And of course, also knowledge networks um, may play a role here. What I also think is crucial is to think about the broader implications of, you know, what we validate. So like I'm working with some colleagues on some new uh, AI tools and we, I, I um, <laughs> like when explainability is a big buzzword in AI. Like you've all probably heard it. I have been surprised by how many, how little empirical validation there is on XAI. So saying, you know, I do explainable AI, I develop a specific type of algorithm and then it's explainable full stop. If it is then explainable to my user, is usually not tested or better, you know, better understood. And um, if it creates the trust, it is supposed to trust to, to create. So I would also make a pledge for, you know, thinking about um, usability, trust, um, and so forth from that angle, not just is the prediction better, is the prediction more accurate? Do I have a longer lead time? But also, you know, does it help people to act? Phil? Yeah, thanks. It's, uh, of course, an excellent question and something which I think we all uh, recognize working in this field. Um, so, so Tina mentioned the first thing. I won't, I won't dwell on that too much, but I think um, the, these networks uh, are very important. So the Disaster Risk Management Knowledge Center, the DRMKC, for example, of the, the, the JRC, I think is doing a very good job of bringing together different uh, data, different knowledge, and I think that's an important role. But also the ones I mentioned before, like Risk Can EGU, also by the way, um, and, and and I think it's also important for uh, us as scientists, project uh, leaders, to make sure that we uh, really invest time to make linkages where we see them between our projects. So, for example. Uh, we identified many projects with one of ours who are looking at these compound risks, and, and many of us have the same case study regions, right? And so if we're all approaching individually these civil protection agencies and so forth, then, then that's quite time consuming uh, for, for our stakeholders. So we, we're trying to connect 
and really make those synergies. So I think that's important to also invest time in that, which means uh, potentially less time uh, writing papers, right? So I think we also need to look at how, how we recognize and also reward these kinds of interactions in science. So there's lots of discussions on this within this, uh, hey, and we're not just looking at uh, a number of journals, et cetera. Would we really think of ways to do that? And maybe one, one final remark, I think, um, is within these the, these case studies that, that, that we're looking at to really try to, with our stakeholders, look at these long-term linkages, linkages across sectors. So some of the most interesting things to me that came out of some of our case studies in the Myriad project was that we simply sat down with stakeholders from very different sectors, energy, infrastructure, food, tourism, whatever it may be, uh, and started the discussion about how, if we were to implement measures in one sector, what does it actually mean to the other sector? Can we find co-benefits? Are there trade-offs? There usually are. Uh, and it was really, for many of our stakeholders, the first time that they've actually had this conversation with different sectors. So I think that's also very valuable. Elena. Yeah, very quickly, I just was prompted by, by Philip's remark to, to say something. So I think we, as scientists, exactly advise this to ourselves very often, develop networks, engage with policymakers. All of this is known to, to people who are working in this field. And also funders provide strong incentives for scientists to do so. What I want to add is that it would be nice to have a similar incentive system on the other side. So, so things, partnerships can only work if there is reciprocity. So as much as scientists can invest time and effort into building networks, again, indeed, taking it away from, from our core business of, of producing research, but there is the, the other side should be should be also ready and willing to actually engage with scientists. And I find that while in science system, as I said, this step has been made to, to create incentives and to, to push scientists, so to say, in that direction, on the side of policymakers, I can also imagine that if even a formal system could exist that would facilitate their willingness to engage with scientists even beyond a very specific and a very applied reason that they may have in a particular moment, just in general, like participating in conferences like this. How many policymakers do we have here in the room? Maybe not so many. So why? Because they don't have time, because the system is not is not set up to 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 actually enable that. So I think we should think about two sides in this respect. Absolutely. Um, yes, please. Oh. And then you afterwards. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the speakers for the excellent presentations. I have uh, a point uh, with regard to the earthquake in Turkey slash northern Cyprus. Two issues. One, and that's one that Tina already touched on, so I'll make it short. How do we deal with um, a matter of preparedness uh, or non preparedness related to the adherence or non adherence to building codes? Uh, in earthquakes or other disasters, um, and the relation or the related uh, and exacerbation of damages uh, and casualties in such events. The second issue, how do we address the ineffectiveness of measures and actions to deal with the casualties and damages which are also uh, which which are also caused by such disasters? Now, these issues, both issues, I think, are also touching on the issue of national sovereignty, sovereignty, and and in other words, if we talk about EU member states, it's one thing. If we talk about countries outside Europe, which still have an impact and a relationship to European countries, it's a different issue. And I wonder how we deal with that. Um, and Tina, before you answer, I'd really love to um, add two things. If you could also look at it from a socially just um, window, you know, social justice as opposed to in the fact of uh, people that are affected, how do we try not to leave anybody behind? Arthur, maybe you'd like to also reflect on that. And also the, um, as the gentleman mentioned, the transboundary uh, effect of uh, compounding crises and natural hazards and uh, everything else that's involved.
Good. Uh, not an easy question, but thanks for, for bringing it up. And I think it's really nice to, uh, to bring this to this panel. So, I mean, of course, um, crisis response, even within the European Union, there are also a lot of governance um, issues and challenges. That's one thing that we've also looked at in the ERR. Because, of course, within the EU, you have subsidiarity principle, meaning that's also something that Arthur stressed a lot. So that we are, we are there, well, he said, we are there to only patch the gaps of the member states up, basically, where they can't respond. They ask for um, international assistance through the civil protection mechanism, for instance. Now, there's, there, there are, of course, a couple of challenges with this. So even within the EU, you know, there are regulations on risk management and risk assessment and who uh, assesses what. But we also know that, for instance, there is uh, a lot of heterogeneity in the data that people uh, send. And, you know, we all know as, as scientists, if you don't have comparable data sets or if like the measurement standards are totally yeah, different, let me say it like that, then um, of course the, the quality of the overall risk assessment is, is questionable. That's why we in our um, in our report came about with a policy option of like you know really doesn't sound very appealing and sexy but uh, standardize the way that risk assessments are made across the EU and maybe more broadly and make sure that states are then accountable also for these assessments and also for implementing these things um, so and of course if we have transboundary um, risks and crises um, which involve the EU, that, that issue even becomes more complicated and, and, and even bigger because then, of course, I mean, there's the assistance um, uh, that is provided um, through also the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the civil protection mechanism. Um, a sister report from, from the uh, evidence review that uh, we developed very much stressed the notion of solidarity as one of the core values. So that has been developed by the EGE, the European Group on Ethics and New Technologies, um, basically saying every decision that is related to crisis is value-driven. Because crisis fundamentally affect our values and also what we value. And they put forward solidarity as a key principle for action. Now, of course, you know, crisis, especially the, 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 the rapid response, when you see these dramatic images from Turkey in that case, but also from other cases, there's always that outpour of solidarity. You know, people pulled from the rubble and everybody wants to give and to help. But then, you know, in the recovery phase, that becomes um, more difficult. And also in the preparedness phase, I would say it's not always like the... the um, the super solidarity, and we've seen that not only, or, in, in, or we've also seen that, for instance, in COVID, with the whole debate about the, uh, the distribution of vaccination or PPEs and border closures and so forth. So really thinking about how we can implement that um, in the in the EU, but also for you know for other crises that affect us and for countries with which we have partnerships up to things like, you know, the, the, the Christmas or Boxing Day tsunami affected a lot of Europeans, although it happened on, an, on the other side of the world. So how can we take into account these kind of events is really, I think, an open question. So I now spoke about governance, values and solidarity. And the third point that I wanted to make is that also, of course, that is linked to social justice. Again, Philip talked about uh, risk assessment and, uh, and vulnerability assessments and so forth in the beginning. Of course, they are also what we assess and how we assess it is enormously um, value laden. And if, for instance, our we do cost benefit analysis and that is only built on um, direct and or even insured losses, then we are not taking into account uh, social justice issues. So there we can also dig deeper and go into, for instance, uh, trying to understand um, the implications for lives and livelihoods um, of different people and also try to understand uh, the distributive aspects much more and bake that into our, say, vulnerability, resilience or risk assessments. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> my long answer to that question. Thank you. Arthur, would you like to pick up on that? Um, yes, I can. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I, I agree fully with Tina that uh, it, it is a 
a very difficult question to answer, especially given the fact that the, 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 the governance of civil protection systems in Europe is also so different. You know perfectly well that you know in some countries the the civil protection is is a competence aligned with the Ministry of Interior. In some areas, it's Ministry of Defense, and and uh, and so on and so forth. So I mean, there are so many different ways of doing uh, that line of work that it's not possible to standardize it, uh, even in the in the aspect of risk assessment. Not to say to be clearly say that we are not intending to standardize anything because exactly we have a supporting competence in that area. Um, so. But that said, it doesn't mean that we cannot support the member and participating state in improving their systems. Uh, why we cannot uh, comment or, or criticize or uh, one way or the other, the building codes of one country uh, over the other, we can support them through so-called peer review. Uh, all member participating states can request a peer review of their disaster risk management system that is fully funded by the European Commission. It works in a way that we then uh, get experts from different uh, from other member states that then conduct series of visits, interviews, uh, and, and research of how the DRM system functions in a given country, and then provide recommendations on, on its improvement. Romania has just undergone uh, this this review last year. Moldova is in the process of doing so right now. So this is a, a tool that is at the disposal for everyone to learn without being criticized for things uh, being uh, good or bad, or but looking at the potential to improve, regardless what's the starting point. Um, and when it comes to the risk assessment, why we cannot standardize the risk assessment that are being done at the, EU, uh, the national level, there are some initiatives that we've been funding at, uh, as the European Commission, as DG ECHO, uh, whereas uh, countries came together to standardize their national uh, risk assessment. Uh, it was not a long time ago, uh, a project that brought together Slovakia and Czechia uh, that decided to have one common methodology for risk assessments uh, based on the commonalities they, of, of the risk landscape that they are facing. So those initiatives are happening. From our perspective, what we are trying to standardize is the, the way the national uh, authorities are reporting to the EU about their uh, risk assessments, so that at least we get a, a common picture um, at the EU level. When it comes to the socially just response, um, in the context of the operations of the civil protection, uh, it is very often the call of the national authorities because once the operational staff is deployed on the ground, they follow the guidelines of the national local authorities. They are being told where to intervene, where, where to set up their base of operations. Uh, and of course, then following their professional judgments, they respond to the needs uh, of the local communities once they have area of, of their response. And of course, as part of our training and exercises efforts that we do with the with the civil protection staff, we try to expose them to different contexts, to different vulnerabilities. We have very often scenarios that involve uh, children. We have people with disabilities, elderly populations. So in that context, the staff is fully professional and is fully prepared to respond to all kinds of contexts. But whether it's socially just to start with, uh, based on the location they're uh, deployed to, and uh, that I cannot answer because that's that's uh, something that is deeply inherent to the decisions uh, done on the national or local level. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, Philip, or Elena. Yeah. Yeah, just a small comment on the question of sovereignty and relation with systemic risks that that that, that we have seen, of course, in in the last several decades that very different crises may start in some parts of the world and then they unfold not recognizing borders and 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 because of all the interconnections that obviously exist in the world in this regard i just want to mention maybe many of you know that um, but there was this proposal very interesting proposal put up by foundation for global governance and sustainability to create what they call global resilience council so names could also be different. It could be Human Security Council or, or other names. But, but the idea is exactly to create a body to support multilateral response to uh, really large crises like that. So with the authority that would be able to coordinate countries, um, organize similar kind of exchanges and cooperation like Arthur was just, uh, was just presenting us, but at possibly at the larger scale. And so on, like like 
in a way similar to the Security Council, but dealing with the issues of socio-ecological crisis of the kind that, that we are discussing. So it's a very interesting proposal. It's, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, um, there are many, many pros and cons here that one can imagine and then how to implement it, but, but that's something that is now being discussed in that regard, exactly because crises do not recognize borders. Thank you, Alina. Um, we have one question that has been waiting kindly for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stefano Terzi from Eurac Research in Italy. Thank you very much for all the presentations. I have um, a question to following up what uh, Philip Ward said about the terminology uh, to Philip Ward, but I think it's uh, something we uh, like to think as a community. And uh, so, but basically um, coming, uh, starting from the fact that there is indeed a need of a, of a common terminology. And, uh, and this is like quite some time that I think it has been debated uh, in the community. Uh, but what I see, it's also that each uh, branches of the community of the natural hazards, they are they adopted in a natural way, different terminologies, like uh, we talk about compound, if it's uh, really more into the climate side. But the more we move down to the uh, risk and the impacts, we might refer to multi-risk, uh, for example, other multi-risk term. So um, my question is, what would be then the benefit of kind of pushing this uh, natural way uh, into some uh, common terminology? And would that, that be useful for, for example, the uh, disaster responders or they are kind of uh, some other level of, uh, let's say, in the, in the world discussion? Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question and a discussion we've been having quite a lot actually. And 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 my take on this is that I, I I don't think that it is necessarily useful to try to push everybody to use the same terminology all the time for the, for exactly the reasons you said, right? So different sectors, different communities, different people use different terminology and have been using that 10, 20, 30 years or more, right? Um, what I think then can be useful is to bring together um, documentation of different uh, terminologies and how they are used differently within different communities, almost like you know a translation eh, that you have French to English dictionaries and, and so forth, but thinking uh, about how is this used by different communities. That's one thing. Uh, secondly is then also within discussions, projects, meetings and so forth, uh, very uh, creating an, a, an atmosphere where you always discuss all these terminologies very openly and where people uh, are, uh, feel safe to, to question uh, the terminology being used. Every, to, to everybody has explained themselves in, in normal language, right? So moving away from jargon, I think, I think that's important. There have been some 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 advances though that have tried to to put out uh, at, at least some some guidance on existing terminologies, and I think that they're important. For example, the UNDRR, led by uh, Virginia Murray, uh, developed the hazard information profiles, which actually for over two hundred, maybe three hundred different hazards, has uh, various um, uh, definitions of what those hazards are. As, not trying to restrain everybody to the same uh, definition, but, but listing the different definitions. I, I think that that's a nice starting point to at least uh, have this um, shared understanding and the understanding of the differences, let's say. Thank you, Philip. Um, I'll put on my journal set on for uh, a few minutes and say that terminologies are extremely important for us to, to distinguish between um, you know, different uh, events and different responses and uh, what it entails really. So uh, however, when there is a lot of confusion over terminologies, when there are multiple of them, it's really, uh, like Philip said, a translation book <laughs> does come handy. So um, Elena, Tina, or Arthur, would you like to pick up on this a little bit? more and go into detail. Arthur, maybe you would like to say something? I mean, I would mostly uh, echo what Philip has 
has said, I mean, and adding to that, that perhaps also the national or native language dimension is also something that, that contributes to the confusion, because very often when we try to translate terms in English that we can agree on, they mean completely different uh, things in our native languages. Uh, and that starts yet another dimension of, of, of uh, confusion or, or, or discussion with, with, uh, with our counterparts on the national level in our national languages. Uh, so not everything is fully trans, you know, transferable in this context, uh, but it's it's true that uh, together with colleagues from the GRC, we 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 look critically at the work uh, done with the uh, by the UNDRR, and and as a kind of our input to the process, we are trying to then uh, streamline or promote the the vocabularies, the work done on the hazards classification by the UNDRR in our conversation, in our collaboration with the member states. Uh, so that at least on the EU level, there is a common understanding of those different uh, terminologies involved. Um, it, we're at the beginning of the process. It's it, it's still very different uh, understanding across different countries, uh, and we're not able to escape from it, uh, at least not in the short term perspective. Uh, so there's a lot of work done. So it's a pertinent question, but I'm afraid it will be coming back um, uh, over and over. Thank you. You know? And if I can jump in, I think it's an excellent question and an excellent point. And the, so cu currently many notions are yeah, subject to interpretation. And of course that brings risk to it. It already was also said with a journalist head on. I mean, it's one thing if we, notions can be extremely powerful and maybe misused. But the other big risk that I see is that we can frame a lot of things under an umbrella term as resilience and all agree on it. <laughs> because it's such an ambiguous word, um, but then potentially no action happens because it's so fluffy that you cannot ever hold somebody accountable on it. So in that sense, really, you know, making things precise um, is important. Um, I think the second part of the question is, was something like, would it help responders or what, like operational responders? And of course, there I would say, of course, you, yeah, if you're operationally responding and setting up field hospitals or trying to drag people from the rebel, you would not have discussion on what is now vulnerability exactly, but it would help, I think, to allocate resources, to prioritize, and especially in the preparedness and recovery phase. I think it is um, extremely important. And also to, um, to understand exactly what we want to measure. Give you one example. I've been working or with a new PhD student on the, um, the resilience dashboard of the J JRC. Um, I don't know if ever, anybody has a look at it. So like <laughs> first time I saw that I was overwhelmed and I was in my office and I see like this giant matrix. I have a big screen and I scroll down and I scroll left and I scroll right. And I see a lot of very colorful boxes. Some of them have nice arrows in there. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> but what should we now make from it? Uh, starting from you know, how can I get an overview on this wealth of data to how do I interpret it? For instance, is, is now, do I measure the resilience of a country or would I assess it by saying which one has the worst indicator on something or would I go with the average level of something? It's like, it's, and that this, this lack of sharpness on how I should interpret this data is I think related to the lack of a definition. So I think the moment we, we or it would be a good opportunity um, for definitions also, if we could link them to precise ways to measure these concepts. And then of course you could still have, you know, the, the differences between the different disciplines and you could say uh, vulnerability earthquakes is something different from flood vulnerability yeah, and so forth. Great, um, Elena? your pass um yeah thank you all for uh, all your insights um and in the context of making a definition and all different methods we use uh, i work for the red cross and we actually try to use these risk assessments to prioritize and preparedness where we want to uh, go and where we want to deliver aid um, but I, what I found out during my uh, research with Tina is that we have a lot of different methods and they rank areas on which have the highest risk. 
but different methods give entirely different rankings. And I think there is a very high urge to validate these methods. My question is, how can we do that in the context of a hazard when all characteristics of the situation don't really make it easy to gather the data to do this validation? Philip? That's a challenging but very pertinent question. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 very difficult to, uh, when we have the limited data to, to be able to do that. I think that some of the um, important points here are to to um, you know to look at various models and 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 what they are saying because we know that no model is correct like so for example in the climate community looking at the ensembles of different uh, climate models and trying to use those to develop some kind of spread of, of uncertainty which will which will always re remain um and then also i i think trying to develop methods that allow us to deal with that kind of deep uncertainty which which will remain so for example uh, these adaptive pathways, right? And, and this is maybe less relevant to the uh, to the immediate response, of course, um, but which allow us to make these forward-looking decisions with, with these change points. Where we, so I, I think that's important to note. Um, I, I also think, you know, you're asking how to validate the hazard data. I think the question goes a lot further, right? So how to how to validate the, especially I would say the exposure data, the vulnerability data, and so forth is to me even even more of a challenge because I, I see quite a lot of work going on to validate this hazard data and, and a lot less on, on the latter. So I, I would also, um, I don't have the definitive answer, but I, I think that's something that we need to work on uh, within the community. Yeah, I think um, having worked in conflict regions for over 30 years, um, I completely second that. It's a very important point. And um, maybe Elena, you would also like to pick up on that a little bit as a systems person. <laughs> Yes, indeed, because uh, it's really important to understand that when we research more into something, uncertainty does not decrease, it increases. So the more we know, the more we actually can understand how much we don't know. Yeah. So therefore, the, the, the intention should be not to reduce uncertainty and come up to one model that tells us all the answers. I'm, of course, exaggerating now. Uh, but rather how we make decisions in presence of that uncertainty and Philip already alluded to that. So it's really that that we have to welcome all these multiple models that produce multiple uh, results because none of the model, of course, is exactly correct. They all represent different parts of the system in their specific way with a specific purpose. So rather we have to learn how to put all this partial information either in our own heads as human beings or to the artificial intelligence, if it ever is created, and then make decisions in presence of that. And of course, there are a lot of methods that are being developed or have been developed already in decision science, including at YASA, how we make decisions under uncertainty. I'm not going to go into details on that, but, but that's one very important uh, avenue for future research as well. Yeah, and Arthur and Tina, would either one of you like to comment on this? Yeah, I can maybe make things for Hi, Lotte. <laughs> I recognized you when you started to speak already. See, I know you well. Um, it's so so the, the the study that she is referring to was also really uh, very surprising for me because we were looking at Burkina Faso. That's a country that is subject to both conflicts and natural hazards, where it's one of these countries where they intersect a lot and also what have we said amplified each other. We took one and the same data set and applied two methods for social vulnerability assessment on them. One, the cutter approach, PCA driven, one, the inform index. That's also, I think, used by the commission. And we got very different results. And we said, okay, but the results, you know, the, 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 the absolute values doesn't matter so much. Let's compare the ranking. But also for that, we really saw that the ranking was in, for some of the communes of Burkina Faso inversed. And that, of course, is going beyond. I have a visitor. It's school vacation here in the Netherlands. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I beg you, stay with me for a bit. Um, but of course, that makes it problematic also for dealing with uncertainties that you can't. So one, of course, you know, highlighting and showcasing that these several models exist is important. But then also, I think we really need to get a step further in our research and discuss 
what do the different methods highlight and what do we see? And that's then again, the link back to social justice and values and norms on, you know, given that it's hard to, 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 to validate something like social vulnerability because the context in the different part is so different and you have dynamic situation that evolves in different ways. Um, then we, we also have to think about what do we measure with these different methods and where do these differences come from? And then from their reason, what do we want these assessment to measure and what should they do rather than saying just, okay, but this is very different and hence that's problematic. Yeah. Arthur. Thank you. I'll pass on that one because I cannot add more than what Tina just said because I don't know that much about the underlying data and methodology of inform index. Uh, other than uh, the fact that it exists and it covers uh, all those that different dimensions that uh, that were also discussed just a moment ago. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello, Emanuele Massaro, European Commission Joint Research Center. And uh, my question is about uh, uh, the knowledge that you have that uh, is important, uh, especially to save life. Uh, and sometimes, especially in real time, this knowledge is in the hands of private companies, especially technology companies. And my question is, uh, what is the current state of legislations or agreement with those companies in order to allow researchers and uh, also agencies uh, or public institutes to uh, use this data in real time, to have this information, to have the raw data and this information for disaster risk management. Thank you. Um, any one of our speakers would like to answer that question? Okay, Arthur, go ahead. I mean, from, from the EU perspective, uh, I mean, we don't have a specific law or regulation that uh, defines the relationship of private sector and, and, and their participation in the technology, contributing to the innovation and technology. I mean, they're an inherent part of many activities that we do, that we fund, you know, Horizon Europe project. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the uh, ideas, that are the examples of projects that you mentioned, uh, the Myriad uh, or others, I mean, they do involve private sector. Uh, they, they are fully present there. And But it's true that the practice differs between different countries, um, depending on their national legislations. Uh, from countries that are having a very strict legal code when it comes to civil protection operations and disaster management, where there's a high level responsibility put on the national uh, civil protection or regional civil protection authorities, to other countries where it's more uh, flexible in a sense of the inclusion of different stakeholders. Um, but there is no one EU regulation in that particular aspect that would define uh, how this relationship should, should look like. And I, I can refer to other panelists, perhaps, for their national experience uh, on this topic. Um, Phil? Yeah, thanks. Arthur. I didn't know the legislation, so thank you for addressing that part of the question. But indeed, I mean, we, we are also running many uh, uh, projects, EU projects, funded projects, where indeed we have private uh, companies on board. Uh, and yes, there's no specific legislation, um, but um, Within our project, uh, we have made agreements within the consortium that any data generated by that project will be open, openly accessible, and so forth. And so I think that there are, uh, and this is encouraged by the uh, Horizon Europe, uh, Horizon 2020, et cetera. So I think that there are uh, many projects which 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 do this. And it's a, uh, it, it's a question of really engaging with those companies at, a, at an early stage in uh, in designing the research. Also to try to look at um, yeah win-win situations for the co-generation of knowledge between the private and the, the public sector. I think. Yeah. Oh, if there are no other, none of our um, speakers would like to pick yeah. up on that. I Maybe a another... quick, quick, quick comment. Well, sure. Very Tina, quick. Go ahead. Of yeah. course, Twitter just got a lot more difficult. I don't know if anybody, so because a lot of the social components on disaster research used to be going via Twitter and social media analysis. But uh, if anybody has tried to get access to the Twitter API recently, it's hard and it's becoming increasingly harder and slower and may be totally shut down. So also there, I think one, of course, we haven't had a massive dependence on a single 
you know, the access point and data collection point for so from like sentiment analysis to misinformation on data that we may not have in the future. That's maybe also something to think about, especially from the European Commission. And um, and um, yeah, also our dependence on that type of data to assess uh, like uh, the, the social components of disaster res uh, response is of course now then very obvious, but also there we could think about how we can complement um, the data collection that is, for instance, happen, happening via Sentinel and others um, on the on the like damage assessment part. How can we get what are other entryways into the social dimension? Yeah, and wanting to add on to that, um, not only the uh, possible misinformation that might be in the social media, but at the same time, uh, the fact that social media can be controlled. Uh, within boundaries of certain countries by the nations themselves. And in the case of a crisis, uh, it becomes a double crisis because when people revert to social media to try to communicate their situation, and if they cannot get their message across even through social media, then it becomes uh, a, even a bigger disaster on the ground. Um, we have one more question. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting discussion. My question goes into exactly the direction we were opening up now, the role of communication of crisis. So um, I think bad communication can make a crisis much worse, but it could also impact further crisis and ongoing crisis, other ongoing crisis. And we have, I think, learned lessons during COVID, but also before we are currently learning lessons with the crisis uh, uh, in, in, in the earthquake region. So. From a scientific perspective, what can media do better? And maybe another question related to that, what can be done with social media? You just touched upon this. From a scientific perspective, what can we learn? What can be done better? Anyone who would like to pick up on that? <laughs> Tina, shall I throw the ball at you? Yeah, it's hard. So one is, of course, that, you know, crisis communication and risk and crisis communication is a field where also in our ERR, we made the case, you know, that is, has its own uh, expertise and realm and is not or often activated too late, right? So one of the policy options we put forward was establish a standing sort of task force um, on that that could advise um, national bodies or the EU in their risk or crisis communication, because we very often see that, yeah, go wrong. Um, of course, then, you know, you would also have to think about how do you do, how do you do that on the different um, areas and on the different perspectives. Now on social media, of course, what we also see on traditional media as well, it's becoming very, very fragmented. So we did one small study on COVID in the Netherlands, where we just asked people, amongst others, where do you get the information from? The Dutch population watched very much the televised press conferences, which was, I think, like very present in any country wherever you lived. But the international population within the Netherlands got their information from the internet very broadly. And then we didn't dig deeper if that was now a blog post on Reddit or some, some Twitter data or whatever else. But I think we have to understand also that fragmentation. And then, of course, all the risks that come with that on social media, on other media um, that have um, that, uh, yeah, that, that uh, like fire up that fragmentation and then lead to filter bubbles and so forth. And that, I think, is also a very nice segue to what was said earlier on uh, like science literacy, maybe, <laughs> say it like that. That, of course, there are also many studies on like data literacy or media literacy that which basically say that um, it helps if people are are educated better in understanding and interpreting what they see on media or social media the problem is just that we see that that effect of making people aware of what they are reading is very short-lived so in principle you would need to have a continuous um, media literacy especially social media literacy a program to help with interpreting and understanding what you see there but i think especially covid showed that that's really tricky because some of uh, some of the tweets and some of the things that came up there looked very scientific 
they were published in papers. Now, of course, we will know that that's then maybe a predatory journal from a fishy doctor from wherever. But that's, of course, not accessible to the general population. So there you also would need a relatively high um, literacy to be able to deal with that. Yeah. And, and um, a quick addition to what you just mentioned, um, also from the journalism part of things, where you're relaying information, I think it's really important that uh, journalism has to become, again, specialized. And um, science journalism, for example, uh, is an open branch out there uh, where it's losing blood. And uh, I think we should have uh, more journalists that are gearing themselves towards more um, privatized areas, private, well, I should say, uh, prioritize areas. Um, and science journalism should be one of those. Philip, uh, Elena, or Arthur, would you like to pick up on this discussion about communicating, communication in general, literacy, or anything else that you would like to add? We have uh, another 15 minutes. And um, if you would like to add, I'll take your comments. If not, I'm going to take the question. OK. We are taking a question for those online. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Marianne Bügelmeier. I'm from the Austrian Institute of Technology. And I would like to state a question or remark more with respect to not crisis management after the crisis has happened, but rather how to reduce vulnerability and exposure due to measures taken now. And it was already mentioned that uh, societal aspects have to be taken into account and what we see now due to this compound risks or yeah, already happening, people get more and more conservative. So we, um, the communication and the, to reach them and to convince them to take measures with respect to climate change, for instance, their people can change their location or their behavior it's more difficult, and we were thinking about also more working with visions. So the current status quo is not good. It has to defend itself. But for people, transformation is difficult. And maybe it gets easier if we display the vision, how it will be, on how it can a certain, so this is my question also, how a certain um, event can result differently under the status quo and when measures are implemented. And then we display the vision on how the future would look like with these measures implemented. And during COVID, at least in Austria, we had quite strict lockdowns, and I mean, also in other European countries, and this was a first, and people accepted them. So I think this is a very important understanding that people accept very drastic measures. I mean, there it was for a certain time, but still they accept drastic measures if it's, I don't know if the fear is enough or whatever reason. So my question is, if you have looked into this vision perspective or what your take is from the COVID-19 measures and the reaction of the people to it. Thanks. Elena or Philip. Elena, would you like to? Yeah. That's yet another component of literacy that is called futures literacy, as we know. So, so that's exactly what you described, that, that besides scientific literacy and digital literacy, that I very much agree also with Tina in the previous comment, we also should develop this future liter literacy so that we have this skill to imagine different futures, positive and negative ones, both, right? And sort of live with, and it also relates a bit to what I said before, live with the uncertainty rather than trying to reduce it sometimes very artificially, but that's of course a big, a big uh, challenge for us how to how to do it, but at least, yeah, that surely we should we should think in that direction, I think. Philip. Yeah, thanks, Ray. It's, it's an excellent question, actually. And um, I think um, w what is very important, right, to 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 improve that that leverage across different different sectors, different parts of society, different people, is um, is is to really uh integrate different agendas also break down the silos we hear it quite a lot right but in yeah not framing um risk assessments decisions only as as risk or climate adaptation or health risk or development or humanitarian action right but a lot of these responses that we can take especially on these these uh, social vulnerability aspects yeah, they are measures which which will uh, which will address all of those different uh, agendas at the same time, right? So I think it's important that we break down those silos because I think 
in doing that, there's actually a lot that we can do, uh, especially when we have this futures approach, right? We have an opportunity to build back better, eh? to build a, a better world. And I think that this positive message also helps to, to bring people on board. I, I see it in my own classrooms, right? So uh, I, I started a, it was called water risks course seven or eight years ago. And in the first year, the, the, the first lectures was all about, you know, all of these increasing trends and increasing risks and how terrible it's going to be in the future. And uh, well, you just see that people go back inside. Uh, so now we bring it very much from the solution space. So, right, so how can we reduce it? And, and we can, there's a lot of things we can do. So I, I would say, let's look for that future, address what do we want to be in the future? What, 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 what's our vision of that future? And then what do we need to do together across all of these addition, different agendas to get there, acknowledging the fact uh, that there will be trade-offs and difficulties and that we can't always uh, um, yeah, um, have the benefits everywhere at the same time for everything. I think that's important. This is actually a nice segue to our conclusion. Um, I'm going to take the final 10 minutes uh, to give our speakers the floor so they can uh, do like short two and a half minute maybe wrap-ups and um, if you can, uh, think about how do scientists and policymakers, the scientific community, uh, or uh, you know the politicians out there, or people who are working with the legal framework of things, how can we do things better or different uh, going into the uh, aftermath, the after phase of the uh, 2030 agenda? Um, what can we do better? than what we have been doing better. Philip already touched base on that. So I'll start with Arthur and move on to Tina and then Elena and we'll close up with Philip again if he wants to add anything else. Thank you. Uh, how to do uh, things better or different? It's a very complex uh, question that uh, it's almost impossible to answer in two minutes, but I would refer perhaps to, to the different points that were made uh, just as a moment ago. Uh, I think the narrative, the communication, uh, the, the dialogue between different parts of the, uh, of the, of the, in a very broad sector that we are working in is extremely important. Uh, it comes with challenges. Uh, it makes people very uncomfortable uh, because it requires changing perspective. It requires changing opinions very often. Uh, but it is necessary to actually do work better. Um, and that's one of the uh, activities or one of the ideas that we're trying to pursue as part of the of the mechanism. Uh, this uh, in a couple of weeks uh, we'll be bringing it together. Uh, representatives of, of science and practice from member states to put them together in the same room and make them feel uncomfortable and discuss different challenges related to the DRM, including risk, uh, risk awareness, risk communication uh, and crisis communication. Uh, so we're hoping but by, that by, by simply exposing uh, people to each other's ideas and perspectives, they'll be able to reshape how they move forward. Um, so if I was to make one message, that would be that one, uh, really trying to, to uh, well, above all, talk to each other and try to understand each other, uh, because that's the baseline or uh, the base to, to, to move further. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Tina. Yeah, thanks. So um, to add what was just said, I think it was a, a, a super, you know, um, interesting session. In, in which we've unpacked a little bit how broad the issues with are that, that we are dealing with here. So we've talked about narratives, communications, governance, assessments, different knowledge networks, about data sharing, data protocols, how to make sense of all these things. So that's like a gigantic um, catalog of things that we are starting to unpack. And I think it's important to realize how broad these issues of crisis and compound risks are. So that's one. If you then ask me, you know, what, what can we do better? I think we've discussed the improvements that are possible with, with respect to many of these fields. What I want to bring up uh, again is my opening statement. I think the last question very much referred also to the link between um, preparedness, also the willingness of people to change potentially their behavior in a crisis or the push, you know, if, you, if the environment is destroyed, the built environment is destroyed and you're building back anyway. These are windows where you can potentially implement change. Now, the, 
And that's very much also recognized in the transition and transition management literature. So where these crisis events are points of brittleness, which are actually can be a catalyst for transitions, innovation and transformation, which I think we all agree that are very much needed. But what happens in practice, and there's also research about that, is that crisis management, yes, does lead to more investment in technology, in data, in better dikes, and so forth, more airplanes to, uh, for, for, for forest fires, but it very often does not lead to policy change. Although that is exactly uh, what would be needed here. So I would then argue is that we have to really think about the different levels of decision making before, during, and in the recovery from a crisis, and try to make sure that we integrate this strategic and more long-term perspective into our decision-making at each of these phases and at the different levels. Because only then can we connect the response to one crisis to the bigger picture. And that will really require us to, to come out of this, you know, one crisis and we deal with it now and we wait for whatever happens next, but to think about, okay, what are the implications of what we do now for other potential crises, for the next potential crisis, for the climate um, uh, change issues that we are dealing with, as well as on other strategic agendas. And that also really requires to rethink um, the way we approach it, but it's also technically and scientifically challenging because it combines complexity and urgency. And we all know that's not easy. Okay, great. So we have bilateral uh, communication and we have decentralized uh, decision making. And Elena, would you like to add anything to that? Yes, indeed, there was, was very interesting discussion and indeed it revealed how many facets this topic has. Just briefly mentioning three, which we already mentioned today, but, but giving them maybe a few more nuances. One is it's really important to do and develop further proper risk assessments where we look at interdependencies between risks. So there are several aspects here. One is so-called tail dependencies. So where we see that the average dependencies of risk, which we can well estimate based on data are not representative of how tails are dependent. So extreme events sometimes are much more, much stronger connected than the averages. So that's one. Another one are interconnections that come from maybe less obvious reasons, or, or the, there is this topic of teleconnections, for example, or in the atmospheric uh, physics and, and so on. So including all those interconnections, which are not always, by the way, amplifying risks. Some, some risks can actually suppress each other. So it's not all adds up, but, but we have to include all these nuances in the proper risk assessment. So second one is, like it was mentioned, but that's really important. Prevention is much cheaper than response. So, so much more focus should be on research on prevention and, and demonstrating this cost-benefit analysis with all possible tools that, that we have. Number three that I want to highlight is building back better, as already was mentioned. What is important is that there is a lot of social science research that shows that people change their attitude to risk after a disaster which affects how they make decisions about building back better or not better. So for example, uh, the social discounting, so, so the, 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 the future, how we perceive the future, actually people become much more, much less confident in future and therefore are not willing to invest this long-term um, time horizon. So this kind of psychological um, uh, factors are important and it's important to understand them. And what's important is to, contact them and to still make decisions that are in 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 interest of long term uh, resilience rather than yeah being caught in those in those psychological traps and much more research is required for that thank you elena and philip yeah I'll keep it short. So three things. One of them, I think I already alluded to just before this these closing statements that was really to uh, yeah, I, I think we've done a lot of excellent work and it needs to continue to look at um, yeah, these interdependencies and, and the future trends, but I think we really need to also focus on the, the solutions, um, how to design solutions, how to do that in, in, in a positive way, um, including dealing with the uncertainty, as, as you said, which will always remain. So that would be one thing. And I think bringing in that forward-looking approach, crossing of different silos can help to do that. 
secondly um would be uh similar to what Arthur said actually so listen 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 right so really take the time to engage listen talk understand uh throw out the jargon also which i think we all tend to speak with even when we have project meetings we introduce the uh, yellow card right so if somebody speaks in jargon we uh, we highlight that that's, that's quite quite nice um and, and then finally, what I really like uh, at the moment is I, I see that a lot of the work in this, this field, which is expanding rapidly, is, is being carried out by um, a lot of very dedicated uh, early career researchers. And I really want to um, yeah, thank you all for doing that and encourage everybody to, to, to really push that forward. I think it's very important. It is that generation that will be most impacted, as, as, as we know. Uh, and I think it's also our responsibility to create um, the uh, the boundaries that allow those early career researchers to step outside their comfort zone, do this, which I said it before, but I think that means also that we really reward and, and recognize people who dare to take this approach and which may lead to fewer publications in journals and that we really take all of these uh, aspects on board. Fantastic. Okay, so we have... Um... Uh, prevention versus response, and we have breaking the silos. And if we had this uh, maybe discussion before the double earthquakes in uh, Turkey and Syria to go back to where we started this session with, um, things would have been much different. And uh, if we had listened to science uh, and if we had uh, strengthened those buildings in the places where uh, in close proximity fault lines were passing, or in the immediate aftermath, if we had listened to scientists who were in the field screaming that there was going to be an atmospheric river that would bring extreme rain, then maybe the debris flow and the flooding that happened in the immediate aftermath wouldn't take so many lives. Or uh, if we uh, didn't have borders, maybe response to Syria would have actually reached to Syria and not be stuck at the uh, border checkpoints waiting for customs. So thank you so much for uh, attending this session. It was, um, from my end, it was very exhilarating and great discussion and great points. And um, I wish we can, I hope we can prolong this uh, discussion um, throughout this year and maybe bring a new session to EGU 2024 next year. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you to all our speakers.